Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories Village Global. Here today with a very special guest, uh, Vinay Gupta, uh, co-founder of Materium. Uh, Vinay, welcome to the podcast. Hi, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Vinay, uh, that, that introduction sells yourself a bit short. Uh, so I will, given your various uh, interests and, and background, uh, everything to do from disaster relief to, uh, to enlightenment. Uh, so I will, um, why don't I let you first introduce yourself, uh, your background, uh, and how you came to, uh, came to the crypto space? Sure. Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm, so I, I'm CEO of Ethereum. Uh, I did the project management for the Ethereum launch. Uh, my first exposure to crypto was in the mid 1990s. Uh, I was one of the original generation cypherpunks, wrote a little bit of software in the 90s, didn't do anything particularly interesting, but I was kind of around the scene. And then after 9-11, I took a change into energy policy, went all the way through energy policy, disaster relief, large scale uh, kind of scenario planning stuff. And, you know, I, I watched Bitcoin come up really carefully, like, okay, super interesting, super interesting, super interesting. But I, I knew from the 1990s that currency alone didn't produce social change. Uh, I'd watched the e-gold ecosystem very, very closely, and I, you know, it just it, we needed smart contracts to be able to build new social structure. So when I heard the Ethereum people talking about smart contracts, uh, I quit my job at a think tank at uh, UCL and uh, just headed directly into Ethereum, and I've kind of been there ever since. Uh, and and what is Materium? And and out of all the things you could have be working on in the crypto space, uh, why that? Well, so Materium actually starts when I'm still at the Ethereum Foundation, because I keep trying to get the foundation to sponsor a project to get the lawyers to figure out how to transfer ownership of physical goods using the blockchain. Because I figure, you know, if we can't buy and sell, you know, houses and cars and, you know, uh, jet engines, whatever it happens to be using the blockchain, we're going to remain stuck inside of the virtual world in the same way that Bitcoin was kind of stuck in the virtual world. It was hard to get goods and services done if the smart contracts couldn't bind onto physical assets and move them around. So I tried to get it done at the foundation, tried to get it done at consensus. People didn't really understand why that was necessary and they thought it was just going to sort itself out. And now I'm just, you know, running a company to try and build this one rivet to put together the crypto world on one side and the physical world on the other, just so that we could buy and sell and rent and lend and all the rest of that stuff, actual physical assets on the blockchain, without having unacceptable legal costs if something goes wrong or having a ton of transactional friction. You know, it's just kind of trying to figure out how to do like an atomic swap for property. You know, the 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 the, the die goes in one side and the apartment comes out the other. We, that, that should just work, right? So that's what I'm working towards. And one thing I want to zoom out and maybe start with is sort of how crypto has changed or will change the game when it comes to fundraising uh, and, and and financing projects. The audience for this is a lot of investors, a lot of venture capitalists, a lot of Silicon Valley. Uh, how do you make sense of sort of the ICO boom, what venture capital can learn from that, what we can learn from that, and how you sort of see uh, the future of fundraising going forward? Well, so in my experience in the blockchain space is that it's clocked about four times faster than the dot-com space. Like three months in blockchain feels like about a year in the app world. It's a, it's a very, very fast-moving space. And a lot of that is because the access to capital was extremely fluid. And frankly, most of it was completely illegal, but that's really only because we couldn't change regulation fast enough to keep up with commercial practice. So I think that I mean the overwhelming sense I have from VC is that it's a fifty year old model. You know, I mean, the Valley's on its third, fourth, fifth generation of VC firms, and it's on like its third generation of actual VC, you know, people. So I think that we need to sort of sit back and think, like, okay, so this model is really good at funding things that look kind of like little software companies that do software as a service. It's much harder to focus the money in structures which are appropriate to risk, say development in say hardware. You know, if you're doing a robotic startup or something like that, you know, the money needs to be in a completely different shape to a software company, but we're still thinking in terms of VC of how you allocate funds to that. If you look at the changes that we've seen in the private equity world over the past three decades, there's been so much more transformation in private equity than there's been in VC, but VC's actually seen far more technological change happen. So 
it's weird that we've got a kind of static pattern for the shape of VC firms when we've got such an incredibly rapidly changing and dynamic funding landscape. Uh, and I think that crypto has the possibility to bridge that gap if we could just figure out how to cut a better deal with the regulators in terms of doing things like changing of credit investor frameworks or allowing the public to you know self-certify that they want to do this kind of high-tech funding. You know, there, there must be other ways of changing the way that this operates. Yeah. As you sort of look out the next you know five five years, when you look at all the value that will be created from from the crypto landscape, how, how would that value? Well, one, where do you think that value will be created? And two, how do you think that value will be captured? Will it be native crypto funds? Will it be the masses? So, I mean, our best possible case here is that the overfunded ICOs don't get completely murdered by the SEC, and they turn into things which look like Xerox Park. You know, I mean, if you've got kind of $125 million raised by a project with 20 people on the staff, they've got more security than professors had when they got academic tenure. They've got a long enough horizon where they know the money's there that they can get all the way down to the bottom fundamental problems, you know, in the field they're working on and get the really deep fixes made. So I have a huge amount of optimism about the potential for the ICO funded entities to get these fundamental breakthroughs that will be field transforming. The doubt I have is that any of them are going to survive the SEC. You know, I have a real feeling that the SEC is just going to methodically work its way through with a mallet. And I think that that is probably necessary in as much as a lot of these things were blatantly securities frauds. But on the other hand, the ones that were well-intentioned people with strong teams and clear ideas that have been, you know, spending the money in a sensible way, paying salaries and doing research, it'd be a crying shame if those people got nuked as well. So, you know, I'm hoping that as the SEC continues to go forward on the regulatory, you know, war path, that they are, you know, sensitive to whether people delivered the goods or not. Uh, because I would like to think that, you know, the investors are better protected by a running company that delivers on its promises than winding the entire thing up and throwing away of perfectly good technologists in jail because they did some, you know, careless fundraising. And I just don't know which way that's going to go as the enforcement rolls out. I mean, the structure of this has to be that you have to generate the wealth by doing things that change the world. And whether that's captured as equity or whether that's captured as tokens, kind of hard to say until the business model finally shakes out. The tokens are a really good way of capturing value inside of a single business process. But if the company pivots, the token holders are potentially left high and dry. So it's it's quite hard to design these things in a way which works better than equity because we've had 300 years of practice with equity. Totally. And if, if you had to guess, you know, five years from now, how are crypto or 10 years from now, how are crypto projects raising raising money or the next generation? Like, what, what does that look like? Um, so for the most part, I think that they're raising money with great difficulty. You know, the, the really good stuff, the fundamental transformative stuff, a lot of those were early actors who just went for it. And now they've got all kinds of liability on the ICO side. The people that were a little smarter and spent a little more time talking to lords before they jumped are now sitting here in the middle of this kind of crypto winter mess and fundraising is hell. Like, I mean, you know, we are a really, really strong play in the space and it's just very hard to get people to commit because they're just like, well, you know, this crypto thing, we don't know. And we're like, well, you know, it's not about the crypto. It's about changing the goddamn world. The technology is there. The hard part about this is getting people to see past Bitcoin, right? You know, if you can see past Bitcoin and you ignore the coins, and you just look at the damn technology, it's very apparent that the world is going to get heavily changed, right? If you just look around all the projects that are running on a hyperledger, there are no coins anywhere in the hyperledger space. Those are just ordinary businesses with new technology. And I always feel like the coin thing it has become such an enormous distraction. It's it's not clear to me how this plays out. Like I could definitely see reasons for targeted currencies that are being used to tie together, you know, complex international business networks to get kind of unified function from a whole that could do alignment of incentives that can handle international payments. But there were far more coins issued than business models that actually needed a token. And I think that a lot of that value is just going to wind up stranded. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the token holders don't forcibly convert back to equity. I, th I think that may actually be how uh, the SEC finally shakes this out, is that in a lot of cases, they may just force conversion to equity. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, a April 1st, 2019, where you're most excited about in the crypto landscape in terms of 
real value being created in the next few years or, or put differently. Let's say we're doing this interview April 1st, 2024, five years from now. We're sort of reflecting back in the last five years in terms of what are the big projects that have come out that have sort of changed the game in some fundamental way or had already been out right. before. What do you, what do you, how do you respond to that? So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where this is, right? And I feel slightly like a traitor to my own cause saying this. But, you know, I mean, I was, I was part of the Ethereum team. I'm very close to the Ethereum community. Ethereum is important to me, right? That said, the most exciting thing that I've ever seen in the crypto space is Stephen Wolfram arriving. You know, I saw Wolfram talking at South by Southwest this year, and it was just, you know, he's one of the smartest people on earth. He's in the same general category of people as Stephen Hawking, and he's up there on stage talking about computational contracts and how they're going to build all of this functionality into Mathematica, and it's going to be the best damn environment for writing smart contracts that the universe has ever seen. I just looked at that, and it's like, okay, the grown-ups have finally arrived. You know, we're really going to get some stuff done here. This is the best news ever. He's got an 800-person team of, you know, the smartest people on Earth. They're already producing the most sophisticated software in the world. And, you know, that notion of like, oh, yeah, right, it's pretty obvious. Mathematica with a blockchain behind it. That's the right answer. It was so revelatory to see that. It, you know, I really felt the weight of the world kind of lifting off my shoulders like, okay, the adults have arrived. Because once you get people at that level of play, you know, looking at the blockchain space, there is so much kind of early stage prototyping crap, which is held together with like, you know, coat hangers and duct tape that has been desperate for people at a much higher level of sophistication to arrive and fix it. And I feel like those people are beginning to arrive. Um, same thing with Telegram. I mean, Telegram takes a lot of flack in the community, but they've got 250 million person installed base, and they've got $1.2 billion to go and hire people that actually know computer science to go and build them a system. So I sort of feel like the early stage, like 1970s homebrew computer club amateur generation, of which I'm a part, are about to get dumped into an environment where you know enormously sophisticated entities are coming here to play ball. And it's going to be a real scramble for the early actors in the space to survive as these folks pile in. And I'm, I'm very glad to see them arrive. It, it really, you know, it was, it, it felt to me like it was a kind of completion to see Wolfram arrive in the space. Like, okay, the most sophisticated software people on the planet are finally here and they're taking this smart contract thing seriously. Okay, this is, this is a, you know, this is, this is a phase transition. And let, let's say it's, it's 2024 and reflecting back in terms on what, Wolfram and, and, and sort of the adults in the room, quote unquote, have accomplished. W what are we saying? Okay, so here's how it works, right? The internet is a single gigantic computer, right? It's a, it's a heterogeneous parallel supercomputer. It's multi-agent. Everything's under other people's control. But, you know, you can provision, you know, 50 petaflops of computing power trivially easily. You can sling around petabytes of data all from convenient web interfaces and there is no spare computer power on earth. Every hard drive is filled with somebody else's backups. Every processor is continuously busy doing whatever it is that needs to be done. You have a, a, an international legal framework which allows you to use your identity globally. We've got KYC regimes which you know permit you to actually do the transactions. You know, if you live in Brazil and you want to hire somebody in Bolivia to go and do a bunch of web design work for you, it actually just works. South South Trade is enabled, and we've got tracking of you know thirty percent of the world's physical assets inside of systems because everything that comes off a production line has a two D barcode or an RFID tag etched on it, and you can go back and trace the thing back to point of origin to make sure there was no slavery in the production. You can extract the carbon footprint. You can offset it immediately. If it's sold on a secondary market, the warranty follows it. and There's no ambiguity about, you know, where did it come from? You know, I mean, just, just we do for physical matter what we did for information over the past 30 years. And it gets, it gets fully integrated into all the supply chain stuff. I mean, it's, you know, you, you just use computers to do the obvious stuff. Like, we, we stop not doing the thing that the internet is obviously made to do, which is act as a planetary resource management system. Yeah. How does Facebook play a role in crypto, or how does crypto play a role in Facebook? Okay, so in Facebook's natural future, Facebook just, just rolls forward on its trajectory, is that Facebook becomes the KYC provider to the entire global banking system. Right? They've got a better idea of who people are than just about anybody even you know, vastly more data about individuals and governments. So they basically just become the thing that does 
KYC and risk analysis for the banks. You know, I mean, Facebook, if Facebook became a credit rating agency, they're going to be far better at judging what kind of credit risk you present than, say, Equifax is. And they basically become an identity provider, and we, the citizens, pay Facebook to provide us with digital identities which are portable. Right? I mean, I, th- I think an enormous number of people would pay Facebook for those kind of services. Facebook just provide identity. That's what they do. Yeah. You you actually gave a talk recently about sort of the future of identity and how blockchain will will affect it. Why don't you spell out your, your, your talk a little bit about how you think that, w- that w- might play out? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in a nutshell here, the, the problem with identity is that we want identity to be perfect, right? We want there to be one digital identity per person. It all, it all, you know, it's supposed to be clean and sensible. But in actual fact, identity is incredibly probabilistic. You know, people are shedding identities, picking them up all the time. There's always a few percent of the population that are doing things like living under assumed names or they've immigrated across a country and they've, you know, thrown away their uh, old identity. They've taken a new name. It's extremely fluid at the edges. So what we really want is for identity to be handled in a probabilistic way. You know, you are 90% Eric, 99% Eric. But if I'm a consumer of your identity, what I want to say is, you know, I want that as a probabilistic statement, right? This individual is 99.4% Eric. And if they turn out not to be Eric and you take a financial loss because of that, we will cover your damages. And that's the regime that we use for credit cards, for example. Credit cards are hugely about insurance. And the reason you can go to Azerbaijan and pay for things with your credit card and it all works out is because when it does go wrong, an insurer comes in and covers the risk. So you don't wind up getting fleeced and losing all your money. And that just fine margin of buffering is what enabled us to build a global transactional network around credit. We don't have any buffering on identity. You know, if you try and do KYC with a bank and you don't pass the KYC, there is nothing you could do. End of discussion, it's over, because they're constantly trying to make identity fail safe. At the same time as we've got massive rampant identity fraud where people are taking out like, you know, credit cards in the name of their deceased grandparents. And the reason that we've got that brittleness in identity is we've got no way of putting skin into the game. You know, we need agencies whose job it is to differentiate entities, to do non-obvious identity awareness, as Jeff Jonas calls it. We need the ability to turn identity management into a risk solution rather than thinking of it as being some kind of brittle binary. And that approach, you know, it's what pays for your backups. It's what pays for your biometrics. It's what allows you to travel and have you know, I mean, imagine how much better the world would be if you could have things like probabilistic identity documents for travel, right? Yes, this is your passport, but you don't have to use your passport for every single transaction in every single place you go. You've got some kind of card issued to you by Visa on the back of a basket of information, including your passport, and it just allows you to get through the world because if there is a misunderstanding, there's somebody there to catch it. You need skin in the game on this stuff or it just doesn't work. How do you think about reputation then in terms of you know, identity verification, but reputation, what people think of you? Do you think it would be a world where in the internet will move more to, you know, pseudonymous or, or anonymous? Do you think we'll have multiple, you know, sort of identities, reputations based on different, uh, different categories? How do you think, see the future of reputation evolving over time? All right. So, I, I mean, I hear I'm a fundamentalist for a position that nobody else shares, which I think makes me a crack. I think that reputation systems are inherently inaccurate and are more or less inherently evil. I, I just hate reputation systems. So the reason they're inaccurate is, I mean, you know, you use Amazon or Airbnb uh, or Uber, and there are really only two reviews, right? There's, this is great, or there's screw you. You know, if you give somebody a three and a half star review on Amazon, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you give somebody a one star review on Uber, you know, you're, you're threatening their livelihood. And that, means that we tend to lie to the reputation systems, right? I mean, there are probably 10 times in the last year when I've gotten into an Uber that had an overwhelmingly strong smell of magic tree, but I'm not going to give the... You know what I'm saying, right? I'm not going to give the guy a three-star review because that's going to harm his livelihood, and Uber doesn't give me the option of saying too much magic tree, right? It, it doesn't It doesn't communicate because it's it's kind of like... It's like moralizing. Is this, is this good or is it bad? And I can't say preferences. Like, driver is super chatty. Well, for some people, that's great. They want a chatty driver because they're visitors in town and they want to hear the stories. For other people, they just want to be left alone. So there's no way for me to express preference. It's just person is good, person is bad. Well, you know, 
the, maybe the guy who likes Magic Tree. You know, it, it's just a, it's like the reputation thing measures the wrong thing, so we never give it accurate information. And the other problem we have with reputation systems is it's like ubiquitous surveillance. It's just you're being watched by your neighbors and your customers rather than being watched by the state. I, I just don't like surveillance capitalism, even if it's like village surveillance capitalism. You know, even if it's surveillance capitalism as a cottage industry, it's still surveillance capitalism. I don't like it. What I want to see instead is global systems of accountability where when somebody screws you over, you can always recover assets in a kind of restorative justice framework. And well, so David Friedman writes about this in a book called The Machinery of Freedom, which is phenomenal. Uh, David Friedman is the uh, father of Patry Friedman, who's currently running a fund doing kind of seasteading stuff. And uh, pa- uh, and the Friedman, the elder, Milton Friedman was, of course, you know, the, the hardest of the Chicago economists. So, you know, there's a, there's a really interesting kind of Friedman family lineage on this stuff. The machinery of freedom model is that basically you just stake money to pay your friend's debts. And if they screw somebody over, you pull money out of that network escrow system and use it to cover the debt. So when I see a reputation system, you know, if I see an Uber driver who's got like $25,000 worth of staked value that they're not going to be a jerk in the car, I feel pretty good about that because if something goes wrong, there's a pool there for compensation and lots of people trust this guy to do the right thing. And to me, that's the reputation that counts. It's not what casual gossip says about you. It's it's will people stake their cash, will they put their value, will they put their assets behind your reliability and behind your professionalism? Oh, and I think that that model was completely revolutionary. Yeah. And how about reputation in the sense of, you know, for when I get introduced, you know, from Patrick to you, uh, I, I, I Google you, I look you up at Twitter, I look you up on LinkedIn. Five, ten years from now, how might that sort of, you know, ev- online evaluation of people be di- be radically different from from what we do today. So let's distinguish this between the kind of social and the professional, right? On the professional, there are kind of two things, right? There's this somebody reliable and there's this somebody brilliant. And these are two different things, right? So downside reputation risk is what protects you when somebody screws something up, right? This has gone wrong. I want to hit the insurance policy. This has gone wrong. We have a dispute. I want to claim on the network to escrow. I want to make a payment. And you know, that approach is pretty practical, right? There's a company called Vouch for Me, which is doing that stuff right now. They're building network escrow systems. And, you know, you could even run that on credit cards. The upside is the thing that you might think of as being like fame, right? And the fame thing is like, you know, how many followers do you have on Twitter? How many people do I know that you know in common on Facebook? It's something that kind of flows across social networks. And that, I think, is much better in terms of a reputation system. Like, reputation systems are good for, is this great? But they're really bad for, is this terrible? So I think that you could see things that look like a bit like, you know, our good old friend, the Facebook like button, where you wind up with kind of public reputation scores that give you some notion of something's relevance or its brightness. How shiny is this? That stuff, I think you can make reputation work for pretty well. But I think it only works in the positive. For the negative, you need accountability, not reputation. Yeah. I, I want to sort of zoom out a little bit because you've had different careers and have thought about things from different perspectives. I'm curious to sort of ask a, a general question, which is what are sort of the most pressing problems you see humanity has in this century? And how has that evolved over the last, you know, two decades for you in terms of where you've chosen to allocate your time accordingly? Yeah. Okay. So uh, now we know the fun begins. So, I mean, our, we basically have two sources of existential risk, right? There are two things that could wipe out the entire species and all life on Earth with it. One of those things is astronomical events, like we get hit by a meteor, or there's a gamma ray burst, we all get toasted. Uh, and you could put Carrington events in there because I mean, they'll kill the technosphere pretty much completely, just with the you know, giant electrical storms. So those are risks that we could take action to prevent, but humans are not responsible for making those risks. The other class of risks is basically just bad engineering risks, like you know biological warfare. That was a really stupid idea. We've put a ton of work into biological warfare. There's just no good reason for that stuff to exist. It, it's it's just the worst thing in the world, and we put an enormous amount of effort into engineering that stuff the hell were we thinking? Nuclear weapons, right? Tell me my potted history of the 20th century in a single sentence. We put the plutonium in the wrong end of the rockets, right? 
You put the plutonium in the bottom of the rocket, you go to like Alpha Centauri by the mid 1980s. If you put the plutonium at the top of the rocket, you just get nuclear war. It, it's just, it's just incredibly stupid. So I feel like our big problem here is that we're just unable to guide technological progress into positive channels. You know, the internal combustion engine, it just turned out it was bad engineering. It was great for the first 50 years. And then for the next 50 years, all that we got was like car crashes, city pollution, and then we discover global warming. You know, why don't we start spending like military style resources doing technological acceleration to get us out of these kind of gutters? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of reconceptualizing global security so that when you have a problem that's caused by inadequate technology, the whole world pulls together to develop the technology to get us away from that problem and to permanently fix it. You know, we, we need global innovation machinery to pull us away from the abysses when we find them. How do we develop that global global machinery? I think Yuval Harari has written a bit about this as well in terms of, you know, our global problems, you know, in his mind being, you know, climate change, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, nuclear war, obviously, which you just mentioned, we're, we're, you know, we're not, are, we're not currently really designed effectively for global cooperation, given sort of, you know, the way states and countries are, 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 are designed. What's your answer to that? So I don't really believe in the nation state. Uh, I think that in, you know, in the nuclear age, if you don't have a nuclear weapon, you're not really a country. And that, that certainly fits with the kind of classical definitions of the nation state, that they've got a monopoly on violence inside of their borders. If you don't have a nuclear bomb, you don't have a monopoly on violence inside of your borders. You know, if the American government decides that they want to go and pick somebody up off the streets of Sweden and just black bag them, they're going to do that. There's nothing the Swedes can do about it because they're not powerful enough for it to make any difference. There's no monopoly on violence. So if you think of the world as having just 15 countries, you know, America, Russia, China, Israel, the UK, France, a few countries that don't officially have nuclear weapons could make them in a hurry if they want to do like Japan and Germany. International politics becomes pretty simple, right? Where you've got nuclear powers, things tend to be pretty good because they don't get pushed around very much. And then you get South America and Africa, where they don't have any nuclear powers on the continents, and they just get the hell kicked out of them by all the nuclear powers that get used to resource exploitation. So, you know, the, the, the global scheme is not actually as complicated as it looks like on TV, right? And each one of those superpower blocks just has a couple of things they do, right? America, America does food exporting and technology exporting. Russia does energy exporting. Um, you know, China does manufacturing. And, you know, they all have really pretty large, you know, national business models that cover the vast majority of the economic output. You know, Israel, technology and financial services. So it's it's not that the global situation is infinitely complex. There are only a handful of actual players, and all of the attention which is spent on people that aren't actual players is completely wasted, right? Like, why does anybody care what the Australian government says? Even the Australians know the Australian government isn't really a government. Right? Sweden, who cares? Norway, what about it? Right? The, the actual world shaping decisions are only being made by half a dozen governments. And even inside of those governments, it's only like 30 people inside of that government that really have any power when it comes to the kind of geostrategic level. We only have to convince like 500 people that international cooperation is the way forward and we'll get it. But those people are security state guys buried way down deep inside of the nuclear bureaucracies doing long-range strategic planning for their nations. And if we can convince those people that their interests are aligned, very rapidly you will get progress internationally. But it's not going to get done through the UN or the 200 country fiction or any of the rest of that stuff. It's a handful of strategic planners inside of the Pentagon and the equivalent structures inside of their countries that actually make the decisions that matter when it comes to long-term geostrategy. The thing that I think we need here is to basically completely throw away pre-global politics, right? Take the nation state, chuck it away. We don't care. None of that stuff really important. What's important is that a bunch of dudes maintaining a nuclear weapon and we live inside of an area that they tax. That's sort of like a nation state, but, you know, we're not so fussy about the borders and all that perceived stuff about, you know, flags and so on. That's not really there anymore. We've just got technocrats with bombs. And that's the real kind of building block of our new political reality. And once you simplify it to technocrats with bombs, and you know, if there's a thing called the Defense Industrial Base Homeland Security talks about, once you simplify it to that, like 
international cooperation shouldn't be that hard. Because the technocrats with bombs all look exactly like each other. You know, half of them went to the same universities. Like, why can't we just get these guys to admit they've all got common purpose? Like, we don't want to use the bombs we built. We understand how bad that would be. We understand science and technology. We don't want global warming. We're de facto in charge of the world, and we've actually all basically have the same values. Okay, well, maybe we can make peace. Right. And if you sort of zoom back out to how you, uh, you know, identified the, you know, the key threats, how, you, how does that coordinate or align or, or not coordinate or align with how you've chosen to spend your time and how you've chosen to make the, what you think is the biggest impact, if that's what you've optimized for? All right. So, I mean, in, in my case, spring of 2001, I was meditating in Chicago and I had a freaking vision. I mean, you know, this is not the kind of thing that you, you know, there's, it's unmistakable if it happens to you. And in my case, the freaking vision I had appeared to be more or less directly drawn from the pages of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or Monty Python. It was hilarious, and it was about human extinction. And it basically suggested that if the entire human race went extinct, there was going to be 100,000 years of bureaucratic cleanup to do afterwards, and nobody could face doing the paperwork, so could I please go and save the world along with like 10,000 other people that were being able to get off their arses. But afterwards, it was like, oh, I really should do something with my life. You know, I'm 30 years old. I'm not actually getting very much done here. Okay, I'll go, I'm going to go make myself useful. And I, I did actually get off my butt to go do stuff. For me, there are the problems which I'm well suited to fixing, and there are the problems which are important. So I'm well suited to fixing refugee housing. Tons of experience. You know, everybody that's gone to Burning Man has seen the hex here. The hex here is great. I could continue doing stuff like that and getting the details right and I'll be good at it and it's fine. And that is going to be precisely zero good if we all get wiped out by malevolent robots. But I'm not well suited to do anything about the malevolent robot problem. So I'm kind of working on the stuff that is both important and that I've got the capability to do something about. And that's not a perfect strategy because what I should be doing is I should be maximizing yield. I should be working on the things which are most important multiplied by my effectiveness and I'm not. I'm just working on the stuff that I'm best at. And that's a kind of, you know, it's an imperfection, but it's something that I can live with. And if I ever figure out a way of being more effective, I'll probably migrate in that direction. But I'm getting, you know, 47, I'm pretty set in my ways. The hardest problem here is how do we pay people to do collective action problems at a level above the nation state? How do we pay people to go out there and handle the AI problem? How do we handle, you know, pay people to go out there and do like, really good climate modeling? How do we get people motivated? Because the university is no longer your tenure. Not everything that's important can be funded in the shape of a company. Charities are not very good at operating globally, and they're very, very bad at making kind of global long-term fundraising plans. It's just quite difficult to build the machinery to run an effective global government without there being an effective global government. And the United Nations, if anything, just gets in the way on this stuff. And how does crypto intersect with the malevolent robot problem, or what is sort of the intersection between crypto and artificial intelligence? Ah, uh, well, no. So, the, I mean, the obvious answer is that artificial intelligence gets to the real world through smart contracts. You know, if the AI system says, right, you know, I got a car, I got an apartment, I got some people getting off a plane, uh, I'm going to hire a driver, and I'm going to put that together into a concierge service, you know, in all probability, the blockchain is how all of that stuff will get implemented at a contractual level. You know, a smart contract is a contract that an AI can sign. When people start talking about kind of super intelligent, godlike AI, to be honest, I don't believe in that stuff. My observation is that the smarter people get past you get past about an IQ of maybe 170, they begin to get gradually and gradually more insane. And I don't think that's because the human brain is unable to support superintelligence. I think it's just that the superintelligence just gets swamped by false positives. You know, you've got such an enormous ability to see correlations that you see a whole bunch of correlations that aren't actually there, but you can't tell the difference between the stuff which is there and the stuff which isn't there, and you just wind up with a mind like overexposed film. So I have a feeling that we're going to get AIs which are extremely fast decision makers, but I'm not sure that we're going to get you know, kind of runaway singularitarian AI, I think it will be torn apart by its own ability to generate narratives which don't bind to reality. So I'm less worried about that. But, you know, there, there's no doubt at all to me that the blockchain is the the containment layer for AI. 
Like you just can't get out to the real world except through going through the blockchain, and that makes sure that the AIs can't do stuff that we're not aware of. P- Peter Thiel has described sort of a potential, uh, you know, conflict or battle between crypto, which he sees as sort of decentralizing force, and AI, which he sees as a as a centralizing force. I think he calls crypto sort of the, you know extreme capitalism, and AI is sort of extreme communism and socialism. Do you resonate with that, or how do you see that playing out? He's a smart guy. He's thought about this a lot more than I have. I think decentralization is largely a myth, to be honest. You know, I mean, we say decentralization, there's one Ethereum foundation. You know, we say decentralization, there are like 20 Bitcoin miners that matter. That is not that decentralized. A couple of friends of mine once did a mind-blowing talk. Uh, I just All my recorders were out of batteries, so we don't have any recording of it. But it was Smarry McCarthy and Herbert Snorrison of the Icelandic Pirate Party at OHM in 2013. And they talked about Kropotkin's belief that the electrical motor would decentralize Russian society. You know, you're going to do all of your agricultural processing in the villages. There'll be no economies of scale. It will decentralize agricultural production. It's going to completely change the world. Uh, And that just tends to be not what happens. So I generally speaking, discount the decentralization thing to zero. I don't think decentralization is going to happen. I don't think it's that important. For me, the blockchain is about transparency, which gives rise to accountability, and accountability gives rise to trust. I think the blockchain is how we force people to be transparent in their doings as they affect the public sphere, and because if the only way that you could get these services to operate is that you have to write to a public blockchain, we can watch what people do. And I think that becomes incredibly important when we think about things like aircraft maintenance. You know, I I want to see a public logbook for every single thing that's been done to the plane that I'm about to get onto. I want that to be public. So for me, I think that the, you know, the ruthless transparency side of this thing is enormously where the value is inside of blockchain. I think that's really where the action is at. And on artificial intelligence, You know, much as we think artificial intelligence is going to be very centralized, I think by the time we actually get to the point where these things begin to operate, we may discover that they look much more like utilities than they look like services. You know, that the AI may be in some sense ambient. I don't know. I'm I'm wait and see on that. AI is not my strong point. Yeah. Going back to your, you know, your, let's say your 90s, you know, cypherpunk self, if you're sort of, you know, put yourself back there and put yourself with your peers back there and sort of, you know, reflect on what you've seen, you know, 20 years later. How would you and your peers back then have made sense of what's, would it have been shocking? What, what would have been different than what expected? How, how would that make sense? Oh, man. I, I mean, I, we would be so proud of ourselves. We would be so proud of ourselves. And, you know, all of our paranoia about, you know, oh, all the Intel chips have been backdoored by the NSA, man. All of that paranoia has turned out to be completely borne out by history. We just nailed that one. We were right. Everyone else was wrong. The fact that we've got a functioning global smart contract platform, actually a bunch of them, absolutely fantastic. The fact that Bitcoin exists and we've got Zcash and all the rest of that. I mean, the, the fuss that we would have made over ZK Snarks as a technology in the 1990s, we had no dream that was possible. So, you know, technologically, we've succeeded out of all possible recognition socially we've just totally underestimated social inertia you know social inertia is just it's the most powerful force in the universe so we we turned out to be completely right about everything but only half a million people noticed right and how do you get over social inertia or how do you get overcome that okay so i i had a radical insight maybe five years ago trying to figure out why nobody was getting off their arse to do anything about social collapse and what I realized was that the English upper classes didn't react to World War I, even though it had killed like one in three of their fighting age men, until about 1925, when they began to notice that they had a lot of unmarried women in their mid-twenties around that were getting very, very angry and causing a lot of trouble. And, you know, it wasn't until years after World War I ended that you began to see real social adaptation to the consequences that had been created by this enormous killing. So what I realized was that social inertia is, it's just intended to roll over small problems. You know, the the society just ignores enormous amounts of human suffering and death until it gets to some sort of critical threshold. And then the society just kind of irrationally lashes out. 
you know, and that process I think is pretty deeply hardwired inside of human beings, because if you're going down to the waterhole and once in a while a lion eats you, probably you don't want to stop going to the watering hole because that's bad for everybody overall. You just sacrifice a few of the week and everybody just kind of pretends it's not happening and just kind of get on with life because that turns out to be evolutionarily optimal strategy. And that is very chilling. Like, oh, we're actually evolved to allow ourselves to be predated to a certain level. And that's why it's so difficult to get people to pay attention to things like the opiate epidemic until it's at such an enormous scale that there's sudden massive irrational lashing out. So, oh, right, let's go to where those lines are. We're going to kill all of them. That's our next step. And so that, you know, those kind of large scale, I think, probably evolved behaviors, I think we just have to really live with that stuff. I'm not optimistic about changing those patterns. I think it's more that the smart folks have to understand that those are the patterns and then figure out how to work with them rather than trying to change them. I think I think we need a much deeper acceptance of human nature as it just is. And then around that, we can start trying to figure out how to make strategy to get progressive outcomes where we need them. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You, we sort of accept human nature for what it is. We acknowledge it's hard to change behavior and perhaps have to change everything around that in terms of infrastructure, interface, et cetera? Well, I mean, if we look at the stuff that works, you know, social media works because it turns out that chimpanzees really like, you know, playing social games with other chimpanzees. You know, it's taking an existing human need and it's providing a much more complicated way of playing that need out. And, you know, maybe it's good for people, maybe it's bad for people, but it's not changing human nature. It's just a new way for us to play the old game. You know, if we want to change human behavior, I think we have to make people better offers than what they've got in front of them right now. I mean, that's not a controversial statement, but most of the offers that we're making people in terms of trying to change human behavior are trying to get people to use willpower to change their behavior because it's morally imperative that they do that. And I think that that is, by and large, unrealistic. good example of this is institutional racism. Like, if you want to stop institutional racism... One of the simplest things you could do is just blind things like grant applications and resumes so you can't see names. And, you know, in most instances, there's no downside to doing that. You get much clearer judging on quality. There's been a bunch of studies. It generally seems to work really pretty well. There aren't much in the way of downsides. You know, that to me is the way that you fix human nature. You just change the procedures, the structures, you know, the fundamental processes, rather than lecturing people about race blind and yelling at people who turn out to be a little bit racist unconsciously, just take away the data. You know, if you were 65 years old and you grew up in, you know, a racist corner of America and you had that stuff drilled into you when you were a kid, it's not realistic to expect every single person that went through that indoctrination to have completely overcome it by the time that they're figuring out who's going to get grant funding. So let's just take away the information that could cause somebody to be influenced and just do stuff blind. And I think that that's the way to approach this. Like, we need to be much less moralizing about these things when you just need to build the machinery that gets the correct behaviors. And are you, uh, are you more of a fan then of, uh, things like libertarian paternalism or, you know, the nudge sort of philosophy of, uh, you know, use government and other vehicles to make, make, make the, you know, choices a lot easier or, or, or lean towards what we, what we want them to be, say, not racist in this case? Yeah, I mean, I think that nudge is okay, apart from the fact that the thing that's doing the nudging is an institution that's got the functional IQ of, like, somebody, you know, I don't know, I, I can't even think of what vegetable you would pick, right? You know, like, I just don't want a potato using nudge. So if we're going to be doing this kind of nudge stuff, I think that we have to have much higher level decision making about who's going to be doing the nudging and how that nudging is going to get done because government is the last place we want to be doing that you know i mean you know if if harvard well i mean think if you took a consortium of like 25 ivy league medical faculties and you had that thing begin to make some decisions about what kind of policies you'd implement with a nudge system you sort of think maybe that's going to be rational. And then you think, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How wrong were these guys on the whole fat versus sugar debate? So, you know, I, I kind of feel like you need to constitute a competent authority before you start rolling out nudges as an approach. And it's pretty hard to identify competent authority right now because the governments have blown it so badly. You know, religion is gone. Government is gone. What the heck do we put our faith in now? To that end, how do you think crypto and governments will, will intersect. And you, you talked earlier, you sort of called a little bit for the fall of the 
the nation state, but is it going to be sort of an all out war? Uh, you know, how, how do you expect blockchain and, uh, governments, uh, nation states to, to intersect? All right. So we got to divide the governments into two piles here, right? There are stupid governments and there are smart governments. The stupid governments are going to fight the blockchain tooth and nail because of issues like tax evasion and censorship resistant social networks, right? And they're going to fight it tooth and nail. The smart governments are going to roll out blockchain and they're going to use it for massive control of their economies and their citizens. It's a perfect tool if you want to run a really, really efficient state. Like if you're a government of Switzerland, you know, we're just going to put everything we could get onto the blockchain because at the end of the day, you know, that will make everything super transparent for our citizens and it will allow people to understand what their government is doing. And if they could see us wasting money, they'll be able to identify precisely where and they can help us close the gaps, you know? Whereas if you take the blockchain and put it in the UK government's hands, you're going to get things like, you know, blockchain registration every time you buy a kitchen knife. So I, I, I just think that there's... There's not going to be a uniformity of response here. The smart governments will be smart. The stupid governments will be stupid. That said, I think that the ZK snarks and the confidential transaction technologies in general are going to provoke a head-on war between government and cryptography of a kind that we haven't seen since the ITAR regulation fights of the 1990s, because that stuff is genuinely threatening to the functioning of the state. You know, I mean, Bitcoin is sufficiently non-anonymous that you could just about run government even in an environment where bitcoin was very very widespread the same thing is not true for situations where people are making payments over a snark system so once you've got genuinely secure private transactions confidential transactions i think that you might see a lot of confrontation between government and cryptography i'm just not sure that that technology is going to be widespread enough in deployment that that fight is going to happen soon I think it might be actually another generation, like 10, 15 years, before there's sufficiently large-scale adoption of anonymous technology that you really do begin to see government backlash. I think it's going to be another generation, because the the mindset that you need for use of high-security anonymity is very, very different from the mindset that you need for, say, using Bitcoin. And I don't think enough people have that mindset yet. So do you think that you know, USA or China is going to be emboldened? In the next, you know, thirty years by by blockchain, uh, or is it going to be sort of at the both extremes? Like the sm- the strongest governments are stronger, but at the same time, we're starting to see a lot more charter cities and a lot more, you know, independent nations or cities pop up. Oh, right, yeah, for that angle, for sure. I mean, so I think the big powers are going to use blockchain as a way of basically managing their empires, right? You know, U.S. government, you know, basically says, you know, Walmart, we want to know far more about where you're reporting stuff from. Walmart rolls out a blockchain, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, off you go to the races. On the other hand, the enormous technological acceleration, the rapid, rapid, rapid rate of change is leaving most governments completely unable to do anything sensible about technology regulation. So they can't block the bad stuff as it rolls in, but they also can't foster the good stuff that they should be sponsoring. And I mean, for example, this whole scooter thing, you know, the scooter thing, it's just like even the slightest trace of common sense in government could have produced a vastly better experience for everybody. You know, it wouldn't have taken much of a push from government to really sort that out so it was as good as it could be and efficient and sensible and all the rest of that. And instead, it's just become kind of a joke. And it may still turn out to be enormously successful, but it just because it's so freaking disorganized, it it really gives the whole thing a bad name. So here's how I think it how it really comes down to. I think that crypto cuts the cost of administering a government to the point where just about anybody can start one. Right? And I think that that's really the crux of this. If I've got, you know, cryptography for managing a register of who owns what physical property, a register of who owns which vehicles, a register of who owns which land, a register of who my citizens are in some way of stashing their biometrics in encrypted containers, you know, I'm f- 70% of the way to being able to run a nation state at a bureaucratic level. And it might be, you know, 12 million lines of open source software that I downloaded mostly from places like Hyperledger. So I think of this as being maybe not so much about crypto directly empowering sort of micro states, just as crypto being part of the arsenal that a bureaucrat would use to run a micro state. Yep. That makes sense. Um, how do you sort of view 
capitalism? Is crypto sort of the now we're entering a sort of a phase of extreme capitalism? Are you a fan of uh, Austrian economics? Are you a fan of more managed, you know, Keynesian or classical uh, school of thought? Where are you on this? Uh, such a great, such a great question. Thank you. So I am of the perspective that what we currently have is information poor capitalism, right? You know, we we all agree that markets are really good at making decisions, but we're also throwing away practically all of the data that people need to make decisions because when we built this form of capitalism, information was expensive, but now information is cheap. So if I look at something in a store, I want to be able to pull out the total transaction history of that object right back to where the metal was taken out of the ground, right? And I think that's my right as the purchaser of that object to get full disclosure about everything that went into that object. And to me, this is kind of like rich contextual capitalism. I want to give everybody huge amounts of information to make their decisions. And then what I want is for them to use software to manage the moral morality and strategy around those decisions. Uh, you know, to me, like, you know, ca- price and price signaling is just not enough data anymore. I don't just want price signaling. I want full bandwidth read, write access to the entire universe of information about my decisions, including the composition of the things that I might buy, including the options that I could have exercised if I'd known they existed. And then I want to use software to crop that complexity down to something that allows me to live. You know, okay, never let me buy cheese on a Thursday. You know, I I definitely don't want to consume anything that comes out of, you know, Bulgaria because I went there on holiday and I hated it or whatever it happens to be, right? Let me express my moral preferences about the world in software and then let the software prune through the offers that capitalism presents me with to represent my values. And I think that that is the, I mean, the inevitable future is that we're going to wind up with like capitalism plus rich signaling instead of just price signaling. Cap, uh, can you unpack that a little bit? Capitalism plus rich signaling instead of price signaling. So unpack a little bit what that would look like. So right now we're constantly asked to make decisions on really, really poor information. So capitalism, as it's typically experienced by people, is that you have a vendor that knows everything and you as a consumer have practically no information to make a good decision. So as a result, the vendors are constantly pushing us around based on information asymmetry. If I want to, you know, for example, get a cell phone plan, there are probably, I don't know, 600 different cell phones that I could buy. There are dozens of different carriers and there are all kinds of weird third order things like, you know, what is it going to cost me to get data access in New Zealand, you know, if I travel there in a year and a half after they've done the 4G upgrade or whatever it happens to be, right? So the insiders inside of those companies have huge access to data. They've got research teams. They know tons about this. And they use that to set pricing in such a way that it basically fleeces the ordinary customer who walks into the store because they, they're being they're basically just beating down the citizens using information asymmetry. And yeah, sure, that's capitalism and that's, you know, the push and pull of capitalism, but it's incredibly information and if sorry, it's incredibly economically inefficient because the poor citizens are making bad economic decisions for them based on being clubbed into submission by people with vast amounts of data at their fingertips. So the kind of capitalism that I foresee is where a combination of efforts like Wikipedia plus things like AI have given us the ability to make decisions as private citizens with roughly the same amount of sophistication or at least comparable sophistication to the companies which are selling us things, right? I want to understand what's in my food about as well as the people that manufactured my food. I want to understand my cell phone options about as well as a professional in the cell phone industry. And we do that by paying for the information and paying for the analysis in things that look like unions, or we use government fiat to basically force companies to disclose their actual costs of manufacturing. And we basically just stop making decisions based on information asymmetry, because we've got the capability to build a society that runs on economies of omniscience. We make all the information available to everybody, and then we make economically and socially optimal decisions based on that availability of data. And that to me is the future, you know, and it, it's a relentless squeezing out of inefficiency through bad decision making by using big data. Yeah. And, and how about on the macro sense? Are you more of the uh, Austrian school or more of the sort of there should be a Federal Reserve at setting inflation, et cetera? Uh, to be honest, it's all crap. I mean, you know, all of that stuff comes from a time when the predominant problems that we face were how to divide up the 
you know, fruits of industrial production, right? So, you know, left-wingers believe the workers in the factory should own the output. Right-wingers believe that the people that capitalize the factory should own the output. Neither left nor right has anything resembling a sensible approach to ecological economics. And if we can't build ecological economics into the heart of the systems of the world, we're going to destroy the planet and it's not going to matter whether or not there's a welfare state at all. So what I want to see is reasoning from ecological limits. We calculate exactly how much we can take out of the planet, and then we build an economic system that divides what we take out of the planet out in such a way that we never exceed the planetary boundary. And you know, if and, and that's what it looks like to build an economic model for the position that we're now in. Right? You know, Marx versus Hayek was about just dealing with industrial production, how it was transforming society. We're already through the industrial production phase. That's no longer relevant. Those guys aren't even wrong. Right? What we needed desperately is ways of pricing carbon. We need ways of making sure that we don't fail the remaining rainforests when we actually need them for things like drug discovery, never mind things like just, you know, carbon sinking. The, the questions that we're asking of our economists aren't even the right questions. Right? The economy is meant to not destroy the, the system that contains it. Right? An economy shouldn't destroy its country, but it definitely shouldn't destroy its world. And our inability to conceive of the idea that we need to design an economics which doesn't destroy the world, it to me is at the heart of the problem. And I mean, Hayek is a really smart guy. If Hayek was alive today, I would love to see what he would do about ecological economics. But until we get to an ecological economics, I don't really care about left-right politics anymore. It's way too late for that stuff. So let's say that people get on board and acknowledge the importance of ecological economics and say, hey, that's sound reasoning. What do we do from there? Like, what are the biggest barriers from us really understanding what our limitations are and, and how to navigate within them? All right. So l- let me propose a really simple thing, right? Right now, the financial system basically is information asymmetric in that when you make a payment, nothing comes back to you. You give them the money, they might give you the product or the service or whatever it is, but there's no bidirectional exchange of information at a fundamental level. What about a system where when I make a payment, they hand me the carbon bill associated with the payment, right? I book a flight and they give me like 1.7 tons of carbon. Like, wow, okay, I didn't want that. Oh, and by the way, here's a bunch of beryllium dust and here's a bunch of other, you know, inevitably economic impacts of flying on this airplane. And you, as the consumer of this service, are just going to have all of this stuff added to your account, Okay. Well, we could do that, right? I mean, if I've got a bank account that stores my dollars, that bank account could also store my carbon. It could contr- contain some kind of estimate of the amount of slavery that my purchasing is supporting. It could give me some indication of whether I'm eating a bunch of things which are in the process of becoming extinct. And damn it, my credit card could warn me. When I make a transaction at a store, you know, I could have an alert that goes off on my phone and it's just like, dude, you know, that tuna was not caught in a sustainable way. Are you sure you want to do that again? No, no, definitely don't let me do that again. Okay, next time it just doesn't let the transaction go through, right? I mean, you know, blinding people to the consequences of their actions has been a huge part of capitalism to date. And we can't afford that kind of capitalism anymore. What we need is markets which reveal information to everybody's benefit rather than markets which conceal information to a few people's benefit. And that is not anti-capitalist, but it just suggests that capitalism in an information-rich environment should not look like capitalism in an information-poor environment. Right? We have to stop acting as inf- information is expensive, and we have to you know, use legislation to do things like break open the databases inside of companies so that we can make economically optimal decisions as consumers. Right? We, we cannot be in a position where we're going to be bossed around you know, by enormously huge centralized data repositories, that's why we have things like antitrust legislation. And the modern equivalent of antitrust legislation, anti-monopoly legislation, has to be action on commercial secrecy. Right. If it isn't about centralization, though, and uh, if it's about transparency, do you worry about a world in which the data silos become increasingly centralized uh, and there's no there's no recourse? Um, frankly, we're already in that world because the governments are so crap at regulating technology, they're not even able to conceive of the question. You know, I mean, we're, we're living in a world where, I mean, in the UK, I think we've got maybe like three STEM graduates in Parliament. 
in the US, I don't think you've got a single person with a physics PhD anywhere in either Congress or Senate. How are they going to understand the world? You know, lawyers understand law. They don't understand anything about engineering. And nearly all of our existential problems are engineering problems. Global warming, it's an engineering problem. Nanotechnology, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, they're all engineering problems. So if we're not going to elect people that have the ability to make sensible decisions about technology, technology will wind up being perpetually misregulated and it will be an increasing menace, you know, and we'll get this thing where everybody pretends there's no problem and then you'll get a massive blowout and then you get overregulation. It, it's just going to be a shit show. How do we get out of this world or overcome that? I mean, if you gave me a time machine, I would go back and I would make Steve Jobs go and see a proper doctor. And in return, he would promise me he was going to run for president. We're not going to fix this until we get a nerd in the White House. And I don't think it particularly matters whether that nerd is a Republican or a Democrat. I think it just we need to change the kind of people that are in government. And the way that you change the kind of people that are in government is you show people that different kinds of people can be in power and you show them what it's like when they are. You know, show me somebody that ran a software company in the White House making decisions about American national technology strategy. Uh, when you think about democracy and when you like, how is crypto in the you know, medium to long term future going to change? Um, or maybe crypto is not going to change, but how are you, so you or change this? How, are you, how do you see governance and the political process evolving? Like, you know, democracy is sort of the defining uh, mode of government. Today, how is that going to evolve over time? Democracy itself or, or something else that might take its place? Oh, what a great question. Okay, so on this, I have some really, really, really good news, right? So I mentioned before, you know, Stephen Wolfram is getting into the whole, um, you know, computational contract space and, you know, just that sense of like, oh, the grown-ups are here. So, you know, David Chom, the guy that originally invented digital cash? Chom has a proposal for setting up a world government on the cheap. It's incredible, Right. And all he basically says is, look, as long as you could randomly pick people and the randomness is really well, proper random, um, then you can basically get statistically significant opinions about events in the world on a tiny, tiny, tiny sample sizes. You know, you robocall 10,000 people across the world. They're guaranteeably random people. You um, run it through a statistical model that, you know, manages the sampling problems like less people have phones in some countries than others. And then you, you know, have a certified translator ask them the question using some kind of, you know, robo dialer. And you log all the responses on a blockchain and then you use that to form maps of global public opinion. And this is incredible because, I mean, it's going to cost you like 10 cents a call. So you raise a thousand dollars, you make 10,000 phone calls and you get a statistically significant ruling from the world on how things ought to be done. Now, I'm not suggesting that those kind of mechanisms would immediately have some kind of legal force, but just being able to get a sense of what the human race collectively thinks about things in a way which is reasonably statistically sampled and fair, I think is incredibly powerful. You know, like, we don't have to live in ignorance of how the world thinks and what the world wants and how the world, you know, desires the future to be anymore. We could build a technological infrastructure using the internet and the blockchain and a few other bits and pieces to reach out there and ask people in a way that's cheap enough that high schoolers could do it for school projects. So I think that there are enormous vistas of possibility opening up here in terms of building global governance in parallel to the existing nation states, in parallel to the UN, but constituted around citizens of the world rather than around institutional power structures. And if you could uh, wave a wand, what should the 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 proper role of government be separate from the role of uh, of markets or what's or what's done within the private private sphere? Okay, so remember that I don't believe in government other than nuclear states, right? So to me, there is no such thing as a government per se, right? You've got the nuclear umbrella, which is the area that you're going to use the nuclear bomb to defend. You've got the nuclear bureaucracy, which is the thing that makes the decisions. And then you've got the defense industrial base, which is the network of companies and labs, and universities and so on, which produce the necessary kind of stuff and personnel to keep the bombs running. And to me, that's the real state, right? I mean, in a, in a 100% just real politics sense, that's the real state and all the rest of it is just a combination of pandering to the past and population pacification. Right. I mean, this is incredibly bleak. It's hardcore real politic. I used to work for DOD. I worked for equivalent structures in the UK. I have a very, you know, 
sharply pointed perspective on these kind of structures. So those entities, their job is to protect their citizens. That's what justifies their existence. Their citizens are far more at threat from global warming and uncontrolled biological research than they are at threat from other nuclear states, right? Our enemy isn't the Chinese or the Russians or the Israelis or the Indians or even the Pakistanis, right? None of those entities, regardless of how unstable they are, are dumb enough to use their nuclear weapons. Our real enemies are our own stupidity and the enormous rising pressure for natural resources from an emerging global middle class. So to me, we need to build protective structures that use technology to shape the future in ways that we can all live with. And that's the natural thing that government ought to be doing, right? It ought to be organizing collective defense, not just from other people, but from our own stupidity. Hey, look, you know, we seem to be smoking ourselves into early graves at an enormous rate on tobacco. Let's have some government-sponsored research to figure out how to get rid of cancer from cigarettes. And if we had taken that approach, we could have had, you know, certifiably, provably non-carcinogenic smoking substances in like the 1970s. But because we don't think the government's job is to do technology research, we've created a situation where the only way that we know how to conduct ourselves is either fighting wars or banning things. There, there's no creative engagement with technology from the state in a way that's explicitly an instrument of public policy. And I think that could be changed extremely rapidly, and it would fix a lot of the problems that we've got in innovation funding that you see in venture capital, because it's not fair to ask venture capital to solve the world's problems. You know, you might get lucky with an Elon Musk once in a while, but it's not fair to ask VC to do the government's job for it. I mean, you see what I'm saying, right? I mean, it's it's just a question of, like, ambition, right? Silicon Valley is really effective in terms of changing the world, but a, an awful lot of stuff is being loaded onto its shoulders. You, you've thought a lot about a lot about the future from, from different angles. How have you been influenced by by reading a lot uh, a lot of science fiction? Ah, um, so I mean, my kind of core thing here is that science fiction is basically, you know, the literature in which engineers, when they're young, figure out how they're going to spend their careers. You know, each each science fiction novel basically lays out a prospectus for a set of things that would be interesting, and then it explores how that technology interfaces with society and. Most of the young engineers that I know that were motivated by sci-fi, they read something and they liked the scenario that was being painted and they said, I'm going to go do that. And that I mean, that was true in my life. I read a short story by Bruce Sterling called Green Days in Brunei when I was a teenager. And in it, there's a you know, Chinese-Canadian engineer who sees a bunch of Buddhist monks building you know, food and shelter and you know, housing technology out of plywood. And, you know, just becomes involved in the project and that becomes what he does with his life. And I remember reading that in you know, rural Scotland in the 1980s and just being like, I could do that. I, I could actually do that. And it was like, yeah, okay, that's what I'm going to do. 20 years later, we get the hex here. So I think that there's a kind of, there's an intercultural transmission that's carried down through science fiction. Arthur C. Clarke proposes the communication satellite, then it becomes real all of this virtual reality stuff, that's all William Gibson and the rest of his mates in the whole cyberpunk world. All the cryptography stuff, it's also the cyberpunks. All of these things are like manifestos for the future and people just see something they like and they then dedicate themselves to building it. I mean, that that's, it's just, I, I don't know how else engineers become engineers. You know, I, I feel like science fiction is completely core to our identities in a way that is not usually acknowledged. Um, I, I've had some dealings recently with William Shatner recently, and I mean, it, it's just like, you know, I, it's it's very hard to think when I'm talking to the guy because, you know, his, his resonance with my entire culture is so powerful. And it sounds absurd, but, you know, like I, I took all that stuff in when I was a kid. So it's completely soaked into my identity in a completely non-rational way. And I think that's how science fiction is for everybody. Yeah. Uh, to, to that point on on identity – uh, talk more about how your Scottish and Indian descent ha has influenced you. So, I mean, I grew up in Scotland before the invention of racism. Scotland in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, I grew up in a super poor neighborhood. I mean, super poor, but, you know, like really serious, like, you know, as bad as the projects get in America kind of levels of poverty. And, you know, it was almost entirely white. 
there were a couple of Asian families, like uh, there were some uh, Vietnamese and a couple of Koreans. There were, you know, a few kids from Bangladesh. There was, you know, me, I was half Indian. And there was just no no racism was ever considered to exist. And even words that you think of as being pejorative, like the word Paki, you know, being short for Pakistani, at that point in Scottish history, that word just meant small shop. There was there was a shop down from my house that was called that, and it, it was owned by white people, operated by white people, and it almost had been. So, you know, it, I, I was lucky enough to grow up as an Asian in a time and a place in Western culture where my race was just never considered to be a factor. Uh, and I think that was an amazing privilege. I'm not sure that anybody has that experience now, not because there's more racism, but because the combination of racism and anti-racism has just made race so much more of an issue. So I got a pretty utopian experience of being of mixed race just because it, that was the place at the time. And then as I grew up, I became increasingly aware that I'd never really fitted into either culture. You know, I didn't have enough of the Indian ways to really get on all that well with my father's family. You know, there were all kinds of little things that they did that I didn't quite understand. There were, you know, postures and procedures and protocols that I was just alienated from. And at the same time, I'd absorbed so much of the Indian world model that I just didn't get the way that my peers operated inside of European culture. You know, they just, you know, they just weren't philosophical in a way that I could relate to. They were very heady and they were very verbal. They weren't very experiential. And it was quite alienating. So what I discovered was that I had to make my own culture. You know, I couldn't really fully reinsert myself into either matrix. You know, I wasn't Indian enough to be Indian and I wasn't Scottish enough to be Scottish. I was something different from both cultures. And what I found when I moved to America was that the people that I related most to in America were also usually from two cultures. You know, and not necessarily, you know, ethnic minorities or, you know, coming from different ethnic groups, but they were people that were profoundly dislocated from their circumstances at some point in their lives. So, you know, I became somebody that was kind of a professional misfit uh, and that turned into being a professional expatriate. I spent a long time in cultures where, you know, I was the traveler rather than the resident. Um, and I think that sense of alienation is pretty much a permanently installed feature now, but there are so many people that have it that we're kind of getting the tribe of no tribe. You mentioned poverty, and I know you thought a little a bunch about poverty in terms of how that's, um, you know, what it's meant to be poor over time, and how that will how that will change in the future as we enter sort of an abundance uh, abundance world. Can you talk about that? I mean, so the first thing is that we're just measuring poverty wrong. You know, I think the only meaningful measure of poverty that I care about is life expectancy and infant mortality. Uh, if people are living a long time and their kids are healthy, I don't really care that much about what's happening after that. You know, I mean, it's, it, life goes on and, you know, things are either good or they're bad, but it's it's not the kind of poverty that I'm really emotionally exercised about. So that kind of poverty, the kind of poverty that shortens lifespan and causes kids to die young, that's mostly a poverty of stuff. You know, it's lack of access to vaccinations. It's doctors that don't wash their hands. It's, you know, no proper care in uh, after maternity, lack of anti access to antibiotics, and it can even be outright starvation. That kind of poverty you could wipe out super cheaply. I mean, it's like, I don't know, maybe $500 per family per lifetime. You know, it's it's incredibly cheap. Like water filters, that are, oh, they're so cheap. You know, fuel-efficient cook stoves, incredibly cheap. Solar lighting, so you don't have kerosene in your house. It's like $10 a lamp. So, you know, that kind of just absolute, you die of it, poverty. I think we could do an enormous amount to stamp out just by getting better technology into people's hands. And I mean, like solar panels, you know, you could buy solar panels on Amazon that are 24 watt solar panels that have USB ports that will charge a smartphone in half a day. And they're like $25, you know, problem solved. That That's, it's just amazing. So that kind of poverty, I think we could stamp out pretty effectively. The other kind of poverty is the poverty caused by an enormous rush into the cities and having the global middle class all competing for the same stuff. So as the global middle class grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, you know, the competition for your grape Poupon mustard and your nice leather jackets becomes incredibly intense. And the fight among the middle class for the status symbols of being middle class, I think is the most destructive thing in the world, 
because the status symbols of being middle class consume about 100 times the natural resources that it needs to just exist. And we're still in a world where a decent number of people don't have the basic necessities of life. Are you are you in San Francisco? Yes. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying. Like, you know, you're perpetually surrounded by people that don't have the basic necessities of life. You know, they may be educated, they may have had jobs, but, you know, things have fallen apart, they've got personal misfortune of some kind, and now they're in a position where they don't even have access to a shower. You know, living outdoors is not that bad as long as you've got access to stable food supply and a shower. And, you know, we, we deprive these people of both things. And we could fix that. There's no reason that the San Francisco government couldn't run showers for homeless people. But we've got this feeling that, you know, like, well, these people are, are not supposed to be homeless, so we're not going to provide anything required for them to be homeless comfortably. And I feel like that kind of thinking just has to stop, right? We either provide you know, a decent standard of living for everybody, or we provide the bare convenient minimums under all circumstances, right? I mean, if we're going to have homeless and we're not going to give them apartments, at least we're going to give them showers. If we're not going to give them apartments, at least we have to make sure they don't freeze to death in winter in places like Chicago. Like, if we're not going to solve these problems properly, we should at least be making sure that people don't die of these conditions. And that applies both to San Francisco and to the entire world. Right? I don't think we can support a middle class of 9 billion people on current technology, but I also think that we could get rid of the remaining you know, infectious diseases we can vaccinate against if we really put our minds to it in less than 10 years. So you know, there's a the sort of confusion here when we say poverty, like let's just stamp out the people dying for the lack of anything that costs less than $10. You know, let's just do that and and not worry too much about the rest of the story until we've got that part fixed. Are, are you a fan of sort of a basic uh, universal basic income like project? And if yes, what could that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't make my mind up on UBI. I have a feeling that it's one of these things we're going to have to try and then modify. And I, I would love it if some kind of medium sized countries gave it a shot and we could see how it goes. What I worry about is that it distributes money, but not power. And I think that there's a lot to be said in terms of, you know, I'd quite like to fix democracy when we're at it. You know, one one vote every four years is like a 300-year-old system, and nothing else that's 300 years old is still good. You know, you don't want to use a 300-year-old transportation medium. You don't want to use a 300-year-old toilet. You don't want to eat 300-year-old styles of food for the most part. You know, why are we still voting in a way that we did 300 years ago? So I think if we're going to do basic income, you might have to pair it with overhauling like you know basic democratic reforms at the same time otherwise you wind up in a system where you're just handing out the money but the population has no more control over their lives than they do now and i'm not sure that that's going to be stable that makes sense i mean you know one of the critiques people have had of communism historically or socialism is that uh you don't have price discovery and you can't adequately assess you know what people need according to their ability you know quote unquote uh, and so you need markets to to better uh, aggregate that information uh in a world with blockchain and, and artificial intelligence where we can we have much more information there is significantly less a information asymmetry could you imagine sort of an ai driven you know communism uh doling out resources in proportion to what uh what people need and, and what they contribute yeah there's a, a fantastic article called uh, in soviet union optimization problem solves you that suggests that communism plus quantum computing could outcompete capitalism. And there are some really kind of technical reasons for that. But basically, you know, capitalism is essentially a genetic algorithm for allocating capital because companies that don't allocate capital well die and then the resources will liberate and you do something else with it. So, I mean, the, the first thing is that I don't think you necessarily need artificial intelligence if you've got legislation that forces open data. So if we make a decision that we're not going to allow companies to exploit their customers based on information asymmetry, that becomes part of consumer protection legislation. You, as a customer, have a right not to be exploited by the company that you're doing business with on the basis of information asymmetry. This means that everybody gets a fair deal. Like, that in and of itself would produce a capitalism so much more efficient than the current capitalism we have. It would be revolutionary. Right? If I can make Uber give me the information that they're using to price my rides so I can figure out when I want to ride and where I want to ride, you know, how much better is my life going to be? 
like just just legislation it's the modern equivalent of antitrust legislation force open the silos right you know by law i'm able to extract my social graph from facebook or twitter and put it somewhere else that's the law that's my property end of story so that in itself will get you a radically better capitalism the differences between capitalism and communism basically boil down to you know questions that are really rooted in the industrial age right planned economies the rest of that kind of stuff you know i mean we know so much about innovation now and the the role of death in innovation it's hard to imagine that anybody would want to go back to a planned economy on the other hand you know the chinese model where the government operates to control the rules of competition very carefully so that if you begin to see monopolistic behavior the government comes in and squashes it in a really proactive way clearly produces a more efficient capitalism than winding up in a capitalism where you've got inefficient monopolies i mean america is ruled by vast crappy companies that everybody hates you know i mean comcast you know verizon you know everybody knows who these companies are they're anti-competitive as hell they're you know revolving doors with government regulators all the rest of that stuff so you know i don't think that you need ai to fix capitalism i don't think you need ai to fix communism what i do think is you need ai to fix stupid like let's just make decisions based on the data force the silos open take the data have academics write models that run on top of the data then demonstrate optimal choices and those choices are maybe implemented by government maybe they're implemented by individuals maybe they're implemented by companies the core thing here is that we shouldn't be in a position where we're compartmentalizing up the world's data in in ways which are provably economically inefficient as a whole like the very function of the state is to try and make sure that the market operates in a reasonably effective way and we're not going to get there unless we start doing something about if information asymmetry producing this kind of decadent corrupted capitalism it's interesting because some people are trying to open those data silos by creating decentralized versions of Uber and Airbnb that will sort of be open in nature yeah. and and you're proposing sort of opening those data silos by legislation. Is that because you're less confident about decentralization or, or am I reading it incorrectly? No, I mean things like DAOs are great in principle, right? I got nothing against DAOs in principle, but you know, we've got ZK snarks now, right? So 10 years well, 10 years, what am I saying? 5 years ago blockchain equaled everybody could see everything everything was open but once you've got zk snarks and the other confidential transaction technologies the fact that it's on a blockchain doesn't mean anything to anybody it could be completely encrypted completely anonymous completely private nobody knows anything and all the transparency benefits are thrown away and i think a society that runs on that kind of cryptography is going to be like mafia states i think we will be miserable there um because people will be exploited by people that they can't even see you know, I think that there is a, a simple trade-off here, right? The government gives limited liability as a, a subsidy from the public purse to investors. That's all that limited liability is. The government waves a magic wand and fiats away liability from investors and puts that liability on the ha- in the hands of debtors. If a company goes bankrupt and it owes you money, you can't claim against the people that that company made rich because they're shareholders and they're protected by limited liability. Um, same thing with patent, right? The government awards patent as a fiat to the corporations and to the individuals, but mostly it's corporations now. And they do whatever the hell they like with their IP for 19 years. And then after that, you know, comes back to this people. Copyright, same thing. Government fiats it into existence. It doesn't exist. So we're in a position where we are producing gigantic government subsidies to entrenched corporate powers that are completely different to the entities that existed when the corporation when things like patent were originally invented the government has the right to change the rules of the game right you know you guys can open up your data silos and if you don't cooperate with us on doing that we're going to cut patent to 10 years take it or leave it you're going to get compliance pretty quickly and that's not about reaching into corporations and taking away their property. It's about acknowledging that their property was created by the state as far as it refers to intellectual property. So there's an enormous amount of room for negotiating with the corporations right up to re-examining whether limited liability is still working for us. You know, what if we have 1% liability? If you're a shareholder, you're liable for up to 1% of the profits you made if the company goes bankrupt. 
there's an enormous amount of renegotiation in the things that we think of as being the fundamental rules of capitalism just to change how government fiat is used to create markets. We are not stuck in this situation with no options. The rules of the game can be rewritten at any time. It just requires a big enough crisis and people with vision and political will to come up with sensible options. And I don't have particularly good stories about what we ought to do, but I'm telling you that we could do a lot. Somebody will figure it out. Well, one other thing you, you've talked about being really excited about or, or talked about the ports of is, is standardization. And I'm curious if you, if you mean that in the, in legal sense and in, in the finance sense and other senses, can, can you unpack that? Oh, sure. I mean, th- this is just the screaming. I mean, you know, my fundamental philosophy on all of this stuff is number one, just stop wasting stuff. Stop unnecessary waste and economic inefficiency. This is dumb. Do not do it. So standardization, you know, I mean, just think of basic things, right? I ought to be able to get a 3D model of any piece of consumer electronics that I buy, and I ought to be able to know from that whether it will fit inside of the same case that I've already bought for something. You know, can I fit my TV into my car? Why can I not just download a 3D model of my television or the television I might want to buy to figure out whether it will fit in the space that I've got for it in my house? You know, th- this this should be standard. It's obvious that there's a CAD model of the TV available. Why is it not linked to the website at a standard URL so I can go and download it so I can model whether the damn thing will fit into my life? Same thing with clothes. Why can we not figure out what size clothes actually are? Why is that not actually standard? If it was standard, we could have computer models of our bodies, and we could virtually try on clothes from a whole variety of different vendors, and we saw something we liked, we could buy it. Instead, there are thousands of people, probably tens or thousands of millions of people, that order huge amounts of random clothing off the internet, try it on, see if they like it, and then ship the other half of it back. Why is this efficient? You know, we're we're still in a position where we just can't get people to tell the truth about what they're offering us. How big is it? Does it fit? What cable do I need to buy to connect it to this other thing? Um, Airlines. Why do airlines not have APIs that will allow me to buy a ticket using my software rather than their software? By law, there should be a necessity that if you make an offer to a consumer, there's an API that drives that offer and you could use third-party software to exercise it. Why do I have to go through their crappy website with all the stupid forms? Right? Tell me the information that I'm required to provide by law, I will provide that information through the API. You will sell me a goddamn ticket, right? All of these kinds of things are coming because we've basically stopped doing consumer protection for new technology. There is no consumer protection for new technology. So as a result, nothing works properly, right? The messes with things like USB standards, like how many different USB cables are there? Like nine, 12? USB-C standards, US 3.3, 3.1, 3.2. You know, the incoherence of all this stuff is because the governments are unable to make any kind of sensible ruling on it. And industry just turns out to be unable to get it right most of the time. So I sort of feel like there's an enormous amount of room for, I don't know, consumer unions, international federations of consumers, um, small manufacturer collectives, you know, second tier governments like Sweden or Switzerland. I just don't know what the right mechanism is. But, you know, it's very clear that we need to be putting pressure on companies to do better because we're realizing so little of the potential benefits of capitalism because we've written the rules of the game in a way that we get, you know, 15 identical scooter companies littering crap all over the streets. And we still can't figure out a sensible way of doing internet shopping for clothes because all of the vendors want to keep their sizing secret so that you tend to buy from the same vendor over and over again because you know that their size 8 fits you. Like, come on, this is just juvenile. These people need to be just seriously told what the hell to do by a competent authority so that the clothes have standard sizes. How, how, uh, talking about law specifically, how, how do you see the way that we sort of think about law changing in the next few decades, if at all. Okay, so the main thing about law is jurisdiction. Um, Where the laws operate is currently something that is seen as being more or less predictably identical with national boundaries, right? American law runs in America, Chinese law runs in China, off you go. That model is not how things actually work in the world anymore. Uh, Take Dubai International Financial Center. There's an eight-block corner of Dubai, which 
for legal purposes, is England. Specifically, it's the City of London. And once a year, they take the current law from the City of London, they export it to Dubai, they re-implement it over there on top of their patch of eight, uh, eight acres, and that becomes the law for the next year. Now, that's happening because it's possible to do things under English law in a clean, convenient way, and everybody knows how it works, and people aren't facing transactional friction and trying to figure out whether their transaction is legal in Dubai. And the Dubai folks have just said, look, if it's good enough for the English and you're just dealing with high finance, it's good enough for us, but we're not going to have any compromising on how our traditional legal system works in other places. The world is increasingly a piecemeal, interactive map of overlapping Paris sovereignties. You know, international treaties like NAFTA enable a sort of para sovereignty, and the United Nations has a whole bunch of para sovereign stuff. International arbitration courts are para sovereign. We we just keep layering more and more layers on the kind of sovereignty stack. So there's more and more complexity about exactly which sets of laws apply in a given situation from a vast international range. Um, so I think the the first big change in law is that I think jurisdiction is becoming increasingly complicated. Um, there's a very, very smart guy, uh, a mate of mine by the name of Boris Mamaluk, who runs a project called CleanUp. And, you know, Boris is thinking about this jurisdictional stuff in a way which is very, very comprehensive. Um, and he's kind of a natural counterpoint to the Materium team, right? We think about stuff, Boris thinks about space. That kind of thinking about jurisdiction, I think, is going to turn out to be incredibly fundamental to how the future operates. Because when you're doing business in a globalized network, just figuring out, legally speaking, where the transactions happen is still an ambiguous thing. And once that's no longer ambiguous, a lot of things will tidy themselves up. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is that in areas where you've got extremely rapid technological change, the state is, generally speaking, unable to legislate. And the good side of that is you get Silicon Valley-style innovation, and the bad side of that is that you get Silicon Valley-style innovation. You know? You get innovation, but you don't get any standardization. Everything is perpetually broken, and it's the consumer's problem if they buy two things and they can't be interconnected. Those kind of problems, you know, they're happening because we haven't figured out that we need to get better at private law, right? There ought to have been some way of having the computer industry self-regulate standards in a way that had some real legal force, you know, and I don't know exactly what that would look like, but think of something that looks like a pri- public-private partnership for making law. You know, we go to the computer industry, we say, right, you're going to have a standardization process. At the end of that, you're going to tell us that there are going to be three cables, and those three cables will be the law for the next 15 years. So you guys figure it out, and in six months, we're going to take a vote, and whatever cable wins, that's what you're going to get. You know, I don't know if that would have been exactly the right way to do it, but you know, there are ways that we could use the power of the state in partnership with civil society and markets to give us a vastly more performant high-tech environment. Technology doesn't have to be disorganized shambles. It only looks that way because we're unable to get government to catch up well enough to come and do its job. And if we don't do that, the alternative is that we're going to get ruled by Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And I don't think we want to lose the competitive spirit of Silicon Valley to monopolists, right? I don't blame these country companies for moving in the direction of being countries. I don't blame them for being monopolists. We gave them a set of rules to play by. Those rules are called capitalist acquisition. They're doing it really efficiently. But that's always come with things like antitrust because the price for limited liability is that you have to do what the government tells you in other areas. Limited liability is not a right, it's a grant. So if we're extending this privilege of limited liability to corporations, I think we've got the right to then figure out how to get them to play nicely so that we get efficient technological progress rather than vastly destructive things like patent battles. The only technology, I mean, the, the, the vast majority of the future work that government has to do is technology regulation. And it, it can't be done by a state that's populated entirely by lawyers. It can't be done by industry self-regulation. You know, we need hybrid forms of technological expertise from industry and technological expertise from government and civil society representation so that we can make decisions about technology which are made rapidly, that are implemented cleanly, and that are actually wise. Yeah. One, one of the things you thought a lot about is uh, is energy. Can you sort of give your punchline of what you 
think we need to do from an energy perspective and what you think the, the future is or should be? Okay, right. So, fantastic. There is a really lovely, I think a master's thesis by a friend of mine called Ed Borgstein. And Ed is a fantastic energy policy analyst. And Ed basically just does a set of diagrams which show you all the world's energy use. And it divides up into basically 12 kinds of energy use. And then he shows you some equations for how much energy can be saved. You know, here's industrial furnaces, here's transportation with wheels. And, you know, he just takes you through all this stuff. We're wasting about 70% of the energy in the world. We're just wasting it. You know, it goes out through the roof and you can afford to put a better roof on it. It gets out through industrial processes, which are hardly ever insulated. It just turns out we're throwing away energy right, left and center. We've got carbon fiber now. Why do cars need to weigh two tons? Like that, That's just, it's not even wrong. So, you know, the first thing is that we could stop wasting energy and we've done practically no work on energy efficiency. It's incredibly weird. It seems to be some kind of human blind spot. It's enormously irrational, but we've done practically no work on energy efficiency. That's the first big thing that could get fixed. Um, second thing is there's an enormous amount of work to be done on making new energy sources like fully adopted. Uh, the solar panels are here. They're coming along incredibly quickly. There are probably a bunch of places where we've got stupid regulation which get in the way of adopting solar panels. Like you're not allowed to put it on your roof because of building codes. You know, that's why you have a federal government. It can stop things like that. Then we get to the kind of weirder energy things like fusion. I still have high hopes for fusion. I'd love to see it come along. We need structural funding on that. And then finally, there's the whole smart grid question of, you know, Buckminster Fuller's long-term vision for the energy system of the Earth was that you run a superconducting ring directly around the equator. And what that superconducting ring gave you was the ability to pump energy from the side of the world where you had um, solar energy and wind energy in abundance because the sun was heating things and cooling things and shining, and to pump it onto the night side of the Earth where you needed it for heating and cooling. And I think Buckminster Fuller got it right. You know, I don't know how far we are away from having that superconducting ring, but that's obviously a much smarter way of doing this than giant batteries everywhere. But the, I mean, the, the, the real heart of this is this. There's no car which is as efficient as an electric bicycle, and you can't ride an electric bicycle to work if there's only a superhighway with like eight lanes and a whole bunch of cars on it. You know, there's a, there's a structural problem here, which is, we need to make room for the solutions that exist to be deployed. And most of those solutions involve moving to a much, much lower energy burn lifestyle at the same time as better kinds of technologies come online. And I, I don't think we're going to see a better approach to managing our energy footprint than insulate all of the things and pedestrianize cities so that you can get around them by bicycle efficiently. And that's entirely doable. I mean, these are these are these don't these aren't like massive capital projects. Talk more about, I know you're big into Buckminster Fuller. What's his sort of biggest contribution, or, or perhaps put differently, what's the biggest learning we should take from Buckminster Fuller? Uh, what do we wish everyone knew about him, or, or what lesson? Oh, wow. Such a hard question. So, I mean, Buckminster Fuller more or less advanced environmentalism, right? He talks about the operating manual for spaceship Earth. The Earth is a spaceship. It's a spaceship where the crew have gone crazy and they're all attacking each other and we can't make a spaceship run properly if there's a mutiny on board. You know, you need world peace before Spaceship Earth will work properly. So that's the kind of high level story. And the low level story is just be efficient. Really think about how your fundamental processes work and optimize the hell out of them. That's a perspective where, you know, you could get behind that. You know, you, you just you look at the examples that Buckminster Fuller has of like the geodesic domes and the fog gun and you know the Dymaxian car and all the rest of that. And he just sat down and he thought really hard about how smart people would do it, and then he designed it that way. And it wasn't incremental on top of what had gone previously. He went right the way back to the human need and then figured out the most cheap and efficient and elegant way of meeting the human need. And anybody can do that, whatever field you're in. You know, you could either do incremental innovation on top of whatever crap is currently dominant in the field, or you could sit down and you could really seriously think about what you're doing and, you know, come up with something that actually works. Yeah. Uh, I want to sort of take the last 10 minutes and talk about a few other other topics that you've been very familiar with. One, one of those is is meditation and enlightenment. And I saw 
uh, a talk you gave and, and one of the points you mentioned in the talk is that uh, becoming enlightened is sort of the equivalent of becoming a PhD, in, you know, in a, in a category, you know, seven to 10 years of all intensive study. Uh, and then another thing you took away is that it's, uh, it's sort of unclear if it's, uh, if it should be a mainstream thing or a thing that we should all strive for and maybe, uh, only that a niche group of people should strive for to feel, you know, a very particular thing. Where, what would you sort of add or correct to what I just said? And what are, what should everybody know about, uh, what it means to become enlightened? Alrighty. So, I mean, on this, I started meditating when I was 14 um, from a little book called The Calm Technique by a guy called Paul Wilson, who later went on to be very famous for writing a whole bunch of other calm stuff. And The Calm Technique is a really good book. I don't know about the rest of his work. haven't read it. Don't know. Sounds a little weird, but The Calm Technique is fantastic. And I did that for an hour a day for eight years. Uh, and then I had some very strange experiences, and then I did even more of it for another three or four years. And at the end of that process, you know, under the tutelage of a woman that had gone to India and come back with enormous wisdom, uh, I passed into a condition that she called enlightened, and it seems to fit what people say in the books. And all that it really means is you get to be really objective, right? I, I get up in the morning knowing that I am a mortal being with a finite lifespan that will die unless something really special happens with the technology. And I can live my life in full knowledge of my own death and the death of other people because my mind doesn't flinch away from the inevitabilities. That turns out to be really useful. And there's no doubt at all that you need some of those people around your society to be able to do hard thinking about really difficult things. But the problem here is the economic cost of enlightenment. I was able to do that because I could spare the time to do it because it was the 1990s. We had world peace. America's economy was booming. And my friends would let me, you know, crash at their houses, sleep on their floors, and do three or four hours a day of meditation and a ton of physical practice. That was about what it took for me to get through. Interestingly, after I got enlightened, the next thing I did was I went back to work, got a job in software, started making bank, and worked my butt off in the real world because I'd done the academic study, I'd gotten what I wanted to get out of it, and then I went off to go and try and build myself a material life that worked. It wasn't, to me, an escape from the world. I just wanted to understand what was happening, and I couldn't I couldn't accept a half measure. I had to go all the way and get my head on my shoulders. So that sort of thing, I think there are always going to be people that are intolerant of paradox and have to get to a fundamental truth before they're comfortable. Maybe some of those people we ought to support in the process of becoming enlightened, because at the end of the day, they just need a ton of free time and they need something to eat. And in that domain, they're much like fine artists who often are just completely driven to create. And if you leave them alone with, you know, their paint and, uh, you know, a source of food, they're perfectly happy. I think we can afford a certain amount of, <clears throat> you know, support of those kind of outliers. And I don't know whether that's a reinvigoration of the monastery system, like you see with monastic academy, or whether it's uh, maybe a side effect of basic income, hopefully. But I think there's a, a lot of room for doing that. Um, the other side of this is that we're very confused about enlightenment and mysticism. And the only thing I can really say about this is that mysticism is mostly medieval explanations for what must be natural phenomena, right? If it happens, it's a natural phenomena. The medieval explanations for things like meteorites and comets are terrible, but often the observations are pretty good. So I think most of the mystical traditions have a reasonable amount of pretty good observational data from the past, but it's all tied up inside of medieval explanations, which are about as good as the medieval explanations were for comets and meteors. So I think we have to kind of go through the traditions and really say, okay, I accept that you saw something. I'm not going to accept your explanation for what you saw, but I'm really going to pay attention to your description of what you saw. And maybe there's a certain amount of mining of the past that we could do on that. As to the rest of it, I mean, you know, I'm I'm very down on the mindfulness movement. I, I just I'm just not seeing how that's actually going to help people very much. Uh, I think it could be dangerous for some and for others. It's just going to be a kind of a distraction. They'd probably do better getting more physical exercise. Maybe. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions people have? You know, sort of have about sort of Buddhism as as it be, you know becomes sort of a mainstream philosophy. Oh wow, yeah, hardcore. Okay, so I mean. Uh, so, uh, Svazov Zizek uh, has a has a brutal critique of Buddhism as being kind of the American Buddhism is kind of like the you know global religion of uh, sort of neoliberalism, 
I think that's a little harsh, but you know, if you talk to like actual Buddhist monks about Buddhism, what they describe is a million miles away from what I term American folk Buddhism. Like American folk Buddhism is like this kind of very vague, be nice to people, but it also involves a lot of kind of superiority and people don't really understand concepts like liberation clearly. They don't have much a sense of what the monks are actually doing. Um, so I think that there's a, a sort of a very nasty oil slick of this kind of superficial spirituality left over from the 60s. And you see a lot of the kind of crass and tacky end of things like Burning Man. You know, lots of crystals, lots of sage, lots of, you know, moralizing, but without anybody actually changing their lives, not very much leading by example, uh, bunches of kind of weird, sticky, nasty, emotional and sexual politics. You know, I just feel like there's a bit of a kind of new age tar pit out there, which is really unlike what traditional Asian spirituality looks like as it's actually practiced. So I kind of feel like we've got a whole bunch of failed experiments over there that really need to be cleaned up. And, you know, some lab tech just has to come along with a bottle of bleach and a squirt gun and just kind of wipe that stuff out. Um, I don't think it's doing anybody any good. I think it's making it really hard for people to access the real traditions. Yeah, totally. The, uh, and does this relate to sort of how earlier you were talking about how your uh, you know, Scottish Indian descent has influenced your philosophy is it on this realm, or I, I cut you off a little bit? But you want to get back back to back to the punchline there. Well, I mean, uh, basically, uh, as my mind expanded as I got into my late teens and early twenties, I just didn't fit inside of the Scottish worldview anymore. And the experiences that I were ha- was having, you know, from all the meditation and so on, put me firmly inside of Indian terrain. Uh, I remember reading the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali in about nineteen ninety two, and it was just like, oh okay, I'm one of these. You know, there was this total sense of recognition, like, okay, I've done about six, seven years of meditation at this point. I've had a bunch of the experiences this book describes. I'm less than a third of the way through the path that they project. But this is clearly my people talking to me about my life experience. I am one of these. And that was the point where I really engaged with Hinduism. And, you know, I engaged with it having been raised as an agnostic with no real spiritual beliefs at all. You know, I did many years of meditation with no spiritual beliefs, no mystical experiences. I just did it because it worked. And I think I was very lucky in that I didn't have any prior exposure to the tradition, so I was completely pragmatic. And then when we got right down to it, it turned out there was a tradition. I had discovered a whole bunch of the basic stuff in the tradition for myself. And then it said, okay, this is the advanced stuff. Take off on this track if you liked it. And that's what I did. You know, when I talk to people about what they think yoga is, it's kind of upsetting. Like, they're very confused. It's very sad. They, they're not getting what they wanted out of the yoga practice. And it's very hard to educate them on what yoga actually is because they think they already know. And that kind of stickiness is intercultural confusion. I mean, it's just, you know, like a tiny percentage of the yoga material has come across into Western mainstream culture. It turns out the system is not stable when you've only got a tiny part of it. You know, and it's just like, you know, if I wasn't so busy doing the disaster relief stuff, I could easily dedicate three lifetimes to just going and fixing the misunderstandings inside of yoga practice. But it's it's just there's no time for me to do it, so I just wind up having to neglect that stuff because I've got practical stuff to do. It's it's hard, you know, it's hard. There just isn't enough of me to go around. It's really frustrating sometimes. Closing here on some of the some of the more concrete, maybe full circle, going back to back to crypto. You know, it's been, you know, over a decade, you know, obviously since, since Bitcoin and then, uh, you know, a few years now, uh, it would seem like, you know, many, many years, uh, for, for, or decades for, for Ethereum, what it seems like. What do you think are the biggest learnings, you know, we've had as a, as a community since Bitcoin and then a few years later since, since Ethereum? Like looking at, out at the first decade, like what's been most surprising or what, what are the biggest learnings we've had as, as a community? You know, there is a saying that, you know, the ICO was basically reality's way of teaching securities law to computer programmers. And my CTO, Rob Knight, says, ah, yes, but at the end of that process, what you get is a bunch of computer programmers that understand securities law. And, I, you know, I feel like what we're discovering here is, frankly, why libertarianism doesn't work, right? You know, brutal as this is, If you look at the total shambles, which is the attempts to organize Bitcoin into something that's capable of innovating, it's been a total failure, right? Bitcoin has 
bunches and bunches and bunches of technical problems. There are all kinds of things that Bitcoin could do or should do or might do. There should have been some kind of you know global fund to enable people to get like lobbying done in jurisdictions that might be friendlier to Bitcoin. We've still wound up with a whole bunch of enlightened self-interest resulting in the damn thing being regulated in completely contradictory ways, not only in different countries, but often in the same country. Um, and it's basically just kind of crap. Like, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of value, but almost no ability to organize any kind of public good stuff, right? And, you know, everybody that ever critiqued libertarianism said, but, you know, tragedy of the commons, how are you going to pay for public works? And the libertarians were like, oh, the roads will always get built. Well, you look at Bitcoin or what I see is potholes that are large enough to swallow the entire damn currency if they're not careful. So first learning is, it turns out that enlightened self-interest is not a substitute for having something that has the ability to do public works. Second thing is, uh, it turns out that securities fraud is incredibly profitable because the public are really gullible. You know, the SEC knew the public were really gullible. They'd seen that stuff before in the 1920s. The ICO markets completely confirmed that ordinary people who've made a lot of money really quickly are absolutely at risk of basic human psychological flaws and the people that know how to exploit that stuff can absolutely destroy them you know we didn't do an ico for materium we looked at it we looked at the legals we said there's no way they're going to be able to make this work by the time we get around to issuing a token it will be in a fully regulated environment and it'll be a financial instrument that anybody can understand in the pre-crypto era and the reason that we've wound up at that equilibrium is because it turns out that the existing financial system is 300 years of work by some of the smartest people in the world. Isaac Newton used to run the Royal Mint in the UK and sort it out our currency for us. You know, like, this stuff is not unsophisticated. Much as we like to laugh at the bankers, it turns out what we're actually laughing at is the regulators. And, you know, that's kind of the final learning on this, is that the regulators are the worst you know, just you know, the, the inability of the regulators to act in a timely way and to get the nuances right, the hemorrhaging of potential. You know, if the SEC had been able to get on top of the ICO market fast, make bold public statements about what it was and wasn't going to countenance and reassure people that they were going to have a regulatory framework up and running in six months, all of the money that went through these wasteful, crappy, illegal ICOs People could have kept it in their wallets, the SEC could have come out with a regulatory framework, we could have started the machinery, and we could have had a vast amount of funding go into whatever that new regulatory framework was, with enormous benefits for everybody. National economies, all the folks that had made money in Bitcoin, the innovation economy itself. But because we couldn't coordinate with the regulators, we've wound up with a disaster where all the innovation happened outside of the regulatory frameworks. Nobody has any idea when they're going to get their door kicked in by the SEC if they did do an ICO. Uh, and we've gotten worst of all worlds. So the, you know, the, the big lesson here is that we need cooperation between innovation and regulation to get to the sweet spots. We've tried it both ways. It doesn't work at either extreme. We are back in negotiation. Yeah. And let's talk about Ethereum specifically, both in terms of adding to the, to the biggest lessons from the Ethereum project and adding more towards, you know, in, in 2030, uh, you know, or a decade from now, 2029, what are we talking about in terms of what Ethereum has accomplished, what it hasn't, what are sort of the big, uh, you know, forks in the road, you know, so to speak, uh, no pun intended for the, for the Ethereum community and, and, and ecosystem? Sure. So, I mean, first thing is the biggest lesson from Ethereum is that community really matters more than anything. Vitalik is, you know, for all of his other talents, a genius at making sure that people understand the moral vision behind something. You know, it, his ability to act as a moral leader who's been a sort of center of kind of, I'm trying to find the exact nuance here, I'm not sure I'm going to get it, but like, nobody has ever suspected Vitalik of acting in a self-centered or self-interested manner, ever. Everybody that spent time with him is completely convinced of the purity of his ideals and his dedication to his mission. And as a result, he's become a kind of like North Star for, at this point, maybe half a million people. I mean, he's become an enormously important leader. And I think the last person that we saw that had that kind of magnetism was probably Richard Stallman, who also came from a place of burning moral purity. Um you know, I often say to people, I think Stallman will be remembered centuries after Gandhi is forgotten because Stallman 
you know, Storm and Shift, right? We got Linux, we got Wikipedia, we got Android, you know, we got an open ecosystem for the fundamental software that runs civilization, and out of that we got the entire dot-com revolution. You know, th- that that to me is what success looks like. Global change that sticks. And Gandhi, much as we love him, did not manage that. So this kind of notion that what we've learned is that moral leadership is critical for catalyzing large-scale social movements. You know, we've seen it with Gandhi, we've seen it with Stallman, we're seeing it around Vitalik. It's incredibly important. It turns out that morality matters. Uh, and that's a huge learning. Like Everybody who's looking at how to change the world, you do kind of have to look at that and say, you know, actually individuals can make a difference, but they have to be that intense, that pure, and that intelligent, maybe a few other properties beside. Um, as for the long-term future on Ethereum, you know, Ethereum right now is sitting at this very delicate balance point where if we get scaling, maybe the global distributed heterogeneous supercomputer will wind up being directly descended from Ethereum. And if we fail to get scaling, it's probably going to be some variation on Microsoft Azure. You know, we're in a position where there's an open vision of the future and there's a closed vision of the future. And we're at a kind of face off between these two sets of potentials. Ethereum Foundation continues to be a difficult organization with a difficult job. Um, it's hard to be well liked under these kind of loads. And I worry a lot that we have not taken the right path on scaling. So if we got it right on scaling, if Vlad Zamfer delivers, and not Vlad personally, but all the people around Vlad that are implementing that vision, you know, if we get to, I don't know, 500, 1,000 transactions a second, we get the network stable at speed on a trajectory where people believe it could get faster than that. If we get there, I don't have any doubt that we could get to a million or 10 million transactions a second. You know, at some point we'll get rid of the EVM and replace it with something which is a lot more flexible. Um, you know, we need probably a new byte code because we know so much more now than we did a few years ago. You know, there's a whole bunch of fundamental transformations which have to happen to get us there, but we've got to get over the hump really this year or next year. Um, and again, and this is one of those things where I kind of wish I could go back to my old job and actually help them coordinate the releases and do the comms work for a lot of that. Um, because, you know, I'm sure that I could make myself useful over there and it's just, nope, I've got to go over here and fix the damn property rights. Um, I really do feel very thin spread right now. I just, I wish there were four of them. Any more commentary on sort of uh, what you think the the suggested approach would be for Ethereum scaling or or, or blockchain scaling more more at large? Okay, so I mean here, uh, this is about a philosophical point, right? But basically, you don't get a global heterogeneous parallel supercomputer by trying to make Bitcoin go faster. You've got to step backwards. You've got to look at the history of parallel computing. You've got to look at the process calculuses like pi calculus and row calculus and all the rest of this stuff. And somewhere in there, you know, probably out of the pi calculus branch of computer science that was big in the UK, um, you get a breakthrough on how you actually build, you know, large scale heterogeneous systems. Um, I think that we should have gone much further back into the fundamental computer science when we were doing the Ethereum scaling work. And I think that we should have hired an enormous number of people from the big supercomputer labs that were used to building, you know, high performance parallel supercomputers. And we should have really aimed for, we want to be able to mobilize 5% of the computing power on the planet for the purpose of doing productive work. Because I, I just don't think we're being ambitious enough when we talk about scaling, right? I want to see an Ethereum client on every laptop that just sits there doing computing jobs for the benefit of society or the benefit of its owner, you know, whenever the machine is not in use. And multiply that by all of the machines all over the world. There shouldn't be a single byte of data that somebody wants to get processed and has to pay for processing and can't afford it, right? Push the price of big data crunching down to a, a you know a near zero point. Nonetheless, I think we could get there incrementally. And if we get to a thousand transactions a second or 10,000 transactions a second, I think inevitably the attempt to get to the next order of magnitude jumps from there will force us down the fundamental computer science path rather than the kind of point optimization on top of existing consensus algorithms that we're currently going after. I should say for context, by the way, that I was, I mean, I was, you know, parallel supercomputer architecture stuff was my fascination in the late 1980s when I was a teenager. 
you know, I was reading all the stuff on Occam and the Transputer and all the rest of that stuff. I was very closely tied to Edinburgh University at that point, even before I went there. Um, you know, I, so I, I, I just, I'm pretty sure we got it right the first time with the Transputer. I think it's, I think that kind of thinking about supercomputer architecture is inevitably going to win in the long run. So uh, with that, uh, I want to be sensitive to to time. Any uh, any last minute plugs uh, you want to leave our, our audience with, or or things that if they want to learn more about you and your work, uh, you'd point them to. All right. So the humanitarian work. The website is called My Hope for the Dot World. I should just called it My Hope for the World dot com, but no, it's My Hope for the Dot World. Uh, that has a pretty good summary of the humanitarian work that I did before I quit and went back into industry. Materium, materium dot com. Uh, we are venture funded. We are building technology. We are growing slower than I'd like us to. And we should have a Stradivarius or possibly one of the other maker violins on chain with all of the supporting data and all the rest of that stuff in May, possibly June. And I don't think until we've gotten that thing done, people are going to understand what we're talking about on smart property. So all I'm going to say is, you know, just we will be shipping things. We'll probably do a run of garden gnomes and pink flamingos that people could use for test purposes. Uh, and I think that's about it. Go to Burning Man, bring a hex here. You'll love it. Yeah, amazing. And, and to that point, at one point you realized that it was uh, it was important not just to work for a passion, but also to work work for money or, or to make uh, to oh. your resources. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Very briefly, the I, I mean, I made a vow sometime around two thousand and one that I was not willing to do anything for money that I wasn't willing to do for free. Right? I made it a vow. It was a religious matter. That was my dar bar. That was my destiny, and I kept that for fourteen years. And I was homeless a couple of times, and I worked on a whole bunch of super important humanitarian stuff that was basically unpaid. And my life was incredibly productive and pure, but it was brutal in terms of the finances. And then, and you know, that was even working at high levels of government, by the way. That that was just how it was. Then I saw a play about Robert Anton Wilson, who I'm sure will have been an inspiration to many of your listeners. It was a it was the biopic or the bioplay of his life, and it turned out that Bob's life was ruined by poverty. Uh, he he had a child that was killed because she was working a dangerous job to help the family make ends meet, and his other kid went mad as a result of the grief of the shock. And I looked at that and I'm like, okay, I'm just doing this wrong. You know, I was watching Elon Musk and Elon Musk was just swinging for human survival in a super direct way, using capitalism as a tool. And I was sitting there laboring on in monastic obscurity, trying to save the world on a shoestring budget. And I just looked at it and was like, right, if Robert Anton Wilson couldn't figure out how to make it work on no money, there's no way I'm going to be able to do it. Elon Musk is doing this right. I am going to follow that trajectory. I'm going to go into market capitalism. I'm going to make as much money as I can. I'm going to pay for the change I want to see in the world. And the, the, remember Gandhi's phrase, be the change you want to see in the world? Now I just say, buy the change you want to see in the world. Because it works, right? And so I threw over my old lifestyle. I went into capitalism. And I was lucky enough to wind up in, in Ethereum first. And the rest is history. That's a good note to to end on. Be the world, uh, by the world. Vinay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a fantastic episode. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 